And welcome to another edition of Dateline Morton Grove. I'm your host, Shel Marcus, and I'm so happy to have you with us this evening. Uh, I think you're going to find tonight's show very informative and interesting because it brings back a guest that we've had, oh, I would think, and maybe he'll, he'll clarify it, at least a year or so ago. Uh, it's a resident of Morton Grove who comes with a big, broad history of involvement in um, something that I think you'll all remember. It's radio. Remember radio? Uh, it's a very, very good neighbor and friend that you're going to find out things about some of the shows that you used to listen to as a kid that you're probably talking to your children about today. So if you stay tuned, I think you're going to find the next half hour most informative on Dateline Morton Grove. Don't go away. We'll be right back with our very special guest. When the cowboy rides off into the sunset, it's always the end. Maybe it's because too much sun can lead to melanoma skin cancer. Examine yourself regularly and see your dermatologist. <laughs> Surprisingly, over a lifetime, your child is in less danger being out in the water than out in the sun. One out of five Americans develop skin cancer. Don't let your child be the one. Welcome back again. I'm your host, Shell Marcus, with Dateline Morton Grove. Let me introduce our very, very special guest, a good friend of this show who's back for repeat performance. That's a resident of Morton Grove, Chuck Chaden. Chuck? Shell? Welcome. Thank you very much. Happy Thank to be back. Well, I'm glad that you're back. Uh, you're so busy with so many different things <laughs> that you're doing. Uh, we're extremely pleased to have you with us. And uh, uh, as a resident of Morton Grove, and of course, uh, with all of your old-time uh, radio shows that you're doing, what? The, how many years have you been doing that show? On the air for 27 years now. 27 years. A little better years. than that, actually, yeah. Seemed like only yesterday you started, yeah, I Yeah, and it was a great day yesterday. And, uh, that's and right. It still is. It yeah. is, it is. <laughs> but you've lived in Morton Grove... Uh, Over 32, 33 years, something like that. And, yeah. and this whole business of uh, radio uh, his history and, and your, your whole involvement started as really an avocation. Started as a hobby. Uh, just gathering some radio shows because I missed them. I grew up with them, listening on the floor in front of that Zenith console. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, television came in on the scene, and most of radio was gone, and I missed it. But I started finding some places where you could find some radio shows, and I found other people like myself who were interested, and we started gathering recordings of the old shows and trading and swapping. You know, it's nice that you can trade a radio show because without losing it. Sure. See, if I have a coin collection and you want one of those coins, I may have to, uh, you may have to give up a coin in order to get the coin from me that you want, and vice versa. Same thing with stamps, both with old radio shows. I can make you a copy of that show. You can make me a copy of the show that I want, that you have, and we just, our collection grows then, see? So That's now my, so I started with nothing. I never taped anything or recorded anything off the radio when it was on. And I've got a few shows now. How many shows do you have? A little better than 50,000 radio broadcasts. Amazing, yeah. amazing. Now, you broadcast on a regular basis at the Museum of uh, Broadcast. Right, right. Uh, well, we've been on the air with our Saturday afternoon program called mm -hmm. Those Were the Days, every Saturday from 1 until 5. And we're on WNIB, which is 97.1 on the FM dial. And all I can tell you is I've listened uh, many times, painting uh, rooms, uh, working around the house. Uh, there's nothing more relaxing to be able to still accomplish what you want to do than to listen to some good old-time radio. And your well, the, we're talking about the old-time radio shows. That's the name they've given it to the broadcasts that were on the air nationally and locally in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. <laughs> The Shadow, The Green Hornet, The Lone Ranger, Jack Benny, Fred Allen, Fibber McGee and Molly, 
all of those kinds of programs. And as you say, if you're, you're working around the house on a Saturday afternoon listening to our radio broadcast, you're taking the picture with you. You know, the picture's in your mind. And uh, we, the old shows did what they were supposed to do. They set the scene. The actors were there and all of the other stuff. The music was giving you the atmosphere, but you decorated the sets and you, you know, created the costumes and you saw the actors. What so, was amazing about those mm -hmm. shows was the fact that, as you said, it really tested your, your imagination, which there's always been a discussion that television sometimes doesn't do that. Radio really tested the young, young person's imagination to be able to create that. Well, you see, years ago we had imaginations and we, our imaginations were very active because of radio. Because the, all the stuff was there helping us to use our imagination. When television came in on the scene, our own imaginations started to dull a little bit. Because the picture we saw on the TV tube was the creation of a director or a writer or a producer. And we had no choice. We looked at that scene and we only saw one scene. Whereas if you and I are both listening to Fibber McGee and Molly and Fibber opens that closet door and all the junk comes falling out, you and I hear it the same, but we each see something different. You know, you see maybe the kind of junk that's in your closet at home or up in the attic or under the bed or wherever it is. And I would see my stuff. You know, you might see fishing gear, you know, and I might see hunting gear. Right, and that's the difference. Whatever. Right, that's, that's the, the difference. big difference. You know, last time you were here, mm -hmm. uh, and again, I can't, Thank you enough for coming back because I know you're, you're so Glad busy. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. And it's so nice of you. But last time you were here, we talked about radio in terms of some of those comedy shows, the mm -hmm. great comedy shows like Jack Benny from McGee and Molly. And I said to you, I said, you know, we just don't have enough time to do this. I'd like you to come back and maybe we can talk about other great aspects of radio that really had an impact uh, on our years of growing up. And, and what I'd like to really talk about today was some of those serial shows, those children's shows that had tremendous impact. Um, shows like um, Jack Armstrong, let's use that as, as a beginning point. Jack Armstrong was probably one of the most popular uh, children's shows that, uh, uh, that hit radio at, at the beginning. It did. It was in the 1930s, in the middle 30s when it started. I didn't realize it, it was on all the way back. to the late 40s and almost through that entire length of time it had one sponsor. Can you remember the name of the sponsor? The Breakfast of Champions? Wheaties. 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 <laughs> Wheaties. <laughs> Jack right. Armstrong, Wheaties. the all-American boy. Right, that's right. right. And one sponsor for that. Mm -hmm. that uh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Jack was, uh, uh, it, was a, it started out as he was a high school student at Hudson High. And they oh, used to sing Wave right. the Flag for Hudson High right, Boys. That's right. But pretty soon he was going on adventures with his Uncle Jim and his cousins Billy and Betty. Mm -hmm. And more and more he was away from school. And he was supposed to be taking some schoolwork with him, and his uncle was supposed to be tutoring him a little bit, but that kind of got lost in the <laughs> shuffle as they went around the world and had great, adventure. exciting adventures. And, and you were nice fun. enough to, to bring one of your favorite old-time radios right here. This is my magic radio. This is the magic radio. Because we can tune into any sound from the past. Can we really? Right. Well, do you think we might be able to pick up a little bit of Jack Armstrong from this radio? If you touch that dial... We can get Jack Armstrong. You know, they always used to say, don't touch that dial. Right. I want you to touch the dial, and we get Jack Armstrong. Okay, here I go. I'm going to touch that dial, and let's see if we can listen real closely and pick up Jack Armstrong. Jack Armstrong! Jack Armstrong! Jack Armstrong, Jack Armstrong the all-American boy. Wave the flag for Hudson High, boys. Show them how we stand. Every shower team be champions. Known throughout the land. Wheaties, Breakfast of Champions, bring you the thrilling adventures of Jack Armstrong, the All American Boy. That was that was <laughs> terrific. I didn't realize this radio was that magical. Well, the radio isn't as magical as the as the show itself was. Oh, the, the, see. boy, that brought back kids, memories. Kids would race home after school to get in front of that radio and listen to these these kids shows and we were taking taken away from wherever we were into those magic lands all around the world with our favorite uh, characters like mm. Jack Armstrong and uh, Billy and Betty and all those people and it was just a great adventure and this show was very well written came out of Chicago it was very well written and in fact the scripts were all 
checked for their uh, geographic accuracy mm -hmm. and others their scientific accuracy and uh, about the only complaint that uh, a lot of people that, that some people had about the Jack Armstrong program was that the kids bugged them so much to buy Wheaties so that they could send them the box tops so that they could get uh, well Jack Armstrong had a hyco meter mm -hmm. which is what he called it a, a pedometer <laughs> and you strap the pedometer to your leg S to see how far you see walk. how how much mileage you were walking. You got to eat those Wheaties to get to that's the, right. right. That you was the whole get point. That. Everything course, was tied in. That's right. When your mother sent you to the store, then you could tell her how far you went. You know, with the, wheat, with the you, you know, when you talk about uh, the shows like that, there was another show that that I used to listen to all the time, and that was Superman. Mm -hmm. I think Bud Collier, I think, was, was Superman. Bud Collier I never was, knew that at the yeah, time, yeah. but later on when he was on Beat the Clock on television, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden I found out that he was Superman. Did you recognize the voice, or did you just hear about it? Uh, I think I was, might, might have been told about it, but then I think I tied the voice in after, after a while. Bud Collier was amazing because he, he was the same one actor playing two roles, essentially. He was playing Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for the... Daily Planet. Right, Daily Planet. And then, of course, he would step into a telephone booth and take off his uh, business suit and become Superman. Right. And he had to change his voice while doing that. He would say, well, this looks like it's going to be something special. This is going to be a job for Superman. And then, you know, he'd change and he'd have that stronger, uh, more forceful voice as Superman. But Superman, through its long run, uh, was sponsored again by one single company and it was Kellogg's Pep, Pep cereals. Mm -hmm. and was that because uh, Jack Armstrong was sponsored by Wheaties, so uh, Kellogg's figured well, that out? Well, you know, you're going for kids. What are you selling kids? Cereal. You know, you're selling them cereal. cereal. Today they're selling them, you know, you know $200 Yeah, $200 <laughs> gym, gym shoes, shoes. Yeah. right. Yeah. But then, but then cereal. they were selling cereal. cereal. So the kids were, you know, eat a wholesome breakfast, you know. That's Kellogg's Pep, Pep with uh, fruit and, and milk. That so it. that's what they did. Do you think uh, if I touch this radio, we might be able to hear Superman? You can hear the beginning of one of the great shows for the Man of Steel. The Man of Steel. Let me just go over Do here, and let me see if I can touch this radio. And I'm going to be ever so gently doing this. And here goes. Maybe we can hear Superman. Kellogg Pep, the super delicious cereal, presents the adventures of Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Yes, it's Superman, strange visitor from another planet who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, defender of law and order, champion of equal rights, valiant, courageous fighter against the forces of hate and prejudice. Today, the Man of Steel still searches for Lois Lane, the girl reporter is all but lost to view in the path of a blinding dust storm. We'll learn what happens in a moment. <laughs> I got to tell you, uh, faster than a speeding bullet uh, was, of course, a favorite phrase. More powerful than a the bunch of locomotives. Able to leap tall buildings with a single so, bound. Yeah. Now look up in the air. It's, a man, it's unbelievable. That's right. You know, uh, there's a couple of other shows that, that I hope maybe... I know it's a lot to ask of this radio, this magical radio. This is a super heterodyne. This so is a su oh, I didn't know it was the super heterodyne. <laughs> I just have a regular heterodyne. Um, we're going to have to take a short break okay. because I see that. Mm -hmm. But when we come back, I'd love to hear things uh, like Little Orphan Annie and maybe Captain Midnight. And, okay, and, and we'll uh, get some Ovaltine. And we'll get some Ovaltine. <laughs> That's right. We'll talk about right. that. Okay. We'll be back uh, after uh, this brief announcement. So don't go away because we've got some of your favorite so uh, soap operas for the children. And we'll talk a little about soap operas for you when we come back in our second half of Old Time Radio with radio historian Chuck Shea. There will always be honor. There will always be courage. There will always be commitment. There will always be pride. And there will always be a need for those who make sure it is so. Maybe you have what it takes to be one of us. The few, the proud, the Marines.
And we're back uh, with Dateline Morton Grove, your host, Shell Marcus, with our very special guest, radio historian Chuck Shaden, resident of Morton Grove. Again, Chuck, who brought this wonderful, magical, <laughs> super, what kind of radio is it? Super heterodyne. Super heterodyne. Super heterodyne radio. I didn't realize that. Bringing back some tremendous memories of uh, years gone by. I hope you're enjoying this show as much as I am uh, listening to some of these clips that he brought back. We talked a little bit before with the break about another famous children's show that uh, was probably almost as popular as maybe when Shirley Temple came on the scene in the movies, and that was Little Orphan Annie. That was a cartoon character. Oh, yeah. Well, it was a Tribune comic strip, uh, Little Orphan Annie, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they had an adventure radio show. Through the 1930s, through almost all of the 1930s, uh, Little Orphan Annie was there, and she was uh, getting into one adventure and going into another, going from one to another throughout this whole period of time. Again, sponsored by one of the great radio sponsors for kids, Ovaltine. Rich chocolate flavored oval team. Is that where they had the little orphan any mug? They had the shake up mugs and the and the regular mugs. They used the oval team, you know, you had to you you, you take milk mm -hmm. and then you'd pick a couple of spoons full of this powdery oval team in there. And then you would either stir it up, if you had the mug, you would stir it up, or if you had the shake up mug, it had a lid on it, and then you would shake it like this, you see. Mm -hmm. And then it would turn it was like chocolate milk, but right. it was more vitamin fortified and all that sort of thing. And one thing about Ovaltine in those days, it didn't dissolve very well. So you don't, you'd do the shake-up number and you'd take the lid off and there'd still be Ovaltine floating around the top of it. So, you know, <laughs> but through the 1930s, Orphan Annie sold a lot of Ovaltine and she did it with the help of secret decoders. Uh, Radio Orphan Annie had all kinds of secret decoders, really? and each year they'd have a See, new I, secret decoder. I associate the secret decoder with Captain Midnight. Well, Ovaltine sponsored Captain Midnight in the 1940s. Okay, so there's the connection then. And so they had Orphan Annie decoders, and then when... See, they felt that Orphan Annie wasn't strong enough a character after being on for only 10 years, which is a long time for those radio days. Mm. They needed someone with more adventure. So there was a regional program called Captain Midnight in the Chicago area, sponsored by the Skelly Oil Company. But they, they wanted to take that show nationally. And so Ovaltine took it over, and Orphan Annie kind of went into syndication and then, uh, you know, just kind of faded away. But Captain Midnight came in on the scene, and he was a much more adventurous thing. He was a flyer, and he was sponsored by Ovaltine also, and he would uh, continue in the uh, tradition of shake-up mugs and decoders. And it wasn't a decoder ring. I always thought it was a decoder ring. No, it was a ring. decoder badge. Every, was a, a lot of people say a yes. decoder ring, but it was a decoder badge. Now, other shows had rings. Uh, Tom Mix had a whistling sheriff's ring. Woo -hoo! You know, you'd blow that, and you'd <laughs> signal to another kid who had a whistling sheriff's ring. So. That, was the, that was the code. Yeah, and the Lone Ranger had an atom bomb ring. An atom bomb ring. Atom bomb ring. Now, what the Lone Ranger was doing with an atom bomb ring. <laughs> it really wasn't a Lone Ranger premium as much as it was a premium for Cheerios. Okay. Uh, Which was the Lone Ranger the Lone Ranger. Okay. Uh, but Little Orphan Annie and Captain Midnight were sponsored by Ovaltine. And everything was tied in with box tops. I mean, that was the whole oh, yeah. premise. I mean, it was to well, sell the they, products. That's the way they sold the product. If, you, if every kid listening would buy two jars of Ovaltine and send in two inner seal rings of Ovaltine in. You know how many jars of Ovaltine would oh, be I sold? I mean, and you wouldn't get every kid listening, but so what? And, if you, and the thing is, you really, as a kid, you really had to have the secret decoder because it was used in the story. Oh, and I that's mean, how... Captain it, Midnight said, we've got, you know, we've got the 1945 secret decoder. And then all of a sudden, the, na the, the Nazi spy, Ivan Shark, <laughs> oh, good. he broke the code. Yeah. And Captain Midnight says, don't worry, we've got a 1946 secret decoder. Well, all us kids listening, <laughs> we had to get the 46 decoder because at the end of each of those shows, they gave out a message. Pierre Andre, the announcer, would give out a secret coded message. This was all Chicago. I mean, this it show... was from Chicago, right. but it was nationally heard. But, but I'm saying it was, all, it was done in Chicago. Orphan Annie, Captain Midnight, Jack Armstrong, Tom Mix, all came out Chicago of Chicago. Chicago was a tremendous base of old-time radio. radio. Do you think if I was very gentle with this uh, special super radio, Do you still, I could... still have your secret decoder? As a matter of fact, 
I, I think my mother threw it away <laughs> with my comic books, which I still <laughs> am yelling about. Give here. it a try. Let Sean. me give it and see it if try. we can hear Captain Midnight. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm excited about this. I'll, I'll be very, very gentle. Tuning in to Captain Midnight. <laughs> Captain Midnight brought to you every day, Monday through Friday, by the makers of Ovaltine, America's favorite food drink. Now, have you heard the news? The news about that marvelous new two-piece bright-colored shake-up mug Captain Midnight has for you? That big, handsome, two-in-one shaker-upper it used to make ice-cold chocolatey shake-ups to drink every day? Well, sir, Captain Midnight has one for you almost as a gift. And listen... It's something you want to send in for tonight, for sure. I tell you, I mean, it was like... I had one of those, too, you know, one of those did you? mugs. Yeah. <laughs> it was like uh, being about 40 years ago, being back uh, uh, after school, I hate coming to tell home. you, it's 50 years. I think you're right, it is yeah. 50 years. Yeah, it is 50 years. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, we're aging, but it is 50 yeah, years. Yeah, 50 years. Um, it just, it's just amazing. I remember coming home after school, these shows used to have certain, t I think there were 15 minutes or, or all half was, hours. Most all were 15 minute shows. Right. They were later on in the later 40s, some went to a half an hour, but, but, but after they were, school they, it was 15. Was it every day or three day, times a week? No, Monday know? through Friday. Monday through Friday. And uh, usually the kids shows started around a quarter to five. And they lasted till six o'clock. Till like dinner time. Yeah. Right. But because of that, uh, when the, you know that would keep the kids locked in, but did parents start to get hooked onto to some of these shows? Well, if your dad came home from work a little earlier, he might listen to one of these adventures. But you know, in those days, when dad came home from work, that was dinner time. Yes, that was dinner. If dad came home at five o'clock, that was dinner time. If he came home at six o'clock, it was dinner time. But mom might have heard some of those shows while she was preparing dinner. Mm -hmm. But actually, Mom had her own shows that That's she listened true. to earlier than the kids' shows. I mean, earlier in the day, because from 9 in the morning till about the time when the kids' shows started at maybe quarter to five, she was listening to the daytime dramas or the soap operas, as they've come to be and, known. And they were called soap operas because... Mostly they're sponsored by soap, soap companies. companies. Right? And that, yeah. that was the reason. But a lot of those shows also came from Chicago, didn't they? Ma Perkins came from Chicago uh, Ma and Perkins. many others. I remember, yeah. I think Ma Perkins used to be on at 12 o'clock at lunchtime. Ma Perkins was interesting. She was on twice a day, same show, twice a day, two different networks. Uh, she was on in the eastern half of the uh, country over NBC and in the western half of the country over CBS. And then the stations, were, which were not affiliated with any network, uh, broadcast recordings of the Ma Perkins program. Mm -hmm. So you got Ma Perkins up and down and all over the place, you know. And, and wasn't there other shows like um, Our Gal Sunday? And, and Our Gal Sunday, this little girl from a mining town out west who found happiness with rich and handsome Lord Henry Brinthrop. I mean, these were quarter-hour things. You had got... Mary Noble, backstage wife. Uh, Casey he, Crime Photography. No, no, no. That was a nighttime show. Oh, I'm Casey sorry. <laughs> I got you. I, you're the historian. Yeah. I shouldn't no, jump in like you know, that. Young Witter Brown and the Brown. romance of, of Helen Trent, Trent which that. set out to prove that a woman could find romance and happiness even though she was 35 or oh. more. See? Well, a lot of these shows really <laughs> were ahead of their time in terms of the woman's independence movement, weren't they? In some cases, uh, young Witter Brown was Ellen Brown, whose husband had died, and she was operating a tea room. So she was a business person, you know, she was operating. But she had lots of struggles and lots of romances and things like that. The shows moved along slowly. They were 15 minutes, uh, and they had maybe, uh, you might get a good four minutes worth of commercials for whatever soap product was sponsoring it, or other product that would appeal to the wo woman at home. And there's another show, I think it was called Backstage Wife. It was Mary Noble, Backstage Wife. Mary yeah. Noble, Backstage Wife. And that was, uh, do you think we might be able to hear a little bit of Backstage Wife? If, if we... you're starstruck enough to see her husband as the Broadway matinee idol, tune us in. Oh. Backstage <laughs> Wife, Mary Noble. present once again Backstage Wife, the story of Mary Noble, 
a little Iowa girl who married one of America's most handsome actors, Larry Noble, matinee idol of a million other women. The story of what it means to be the wife of a famous star. I, I tell you, it really brings back a lot of those memories when you listen well, to Well, those, those openings of those shows are so familiar. You know, it's a funny thing. We were kids. We didn't listen to the daytime shows. They were for the, the moms who were at home. And in those days, most of the mothers were at home. But you'd get sick from school one day, and your mother would say, well, stay in bed. You know, don't do anything. Just relax and listen to the radio. So you'd listen to all those shows. And then you'd get well, and you'd go to school the next day. You might not get sick again for eight months. That's true. You yeah. go back in bed, listen to the radio, you're yeah. homesick, pick up the stories almost where you left them. It was amazing. <laughs> they really didn't move that fast. No, there's, you know, recaps and what's right. going to happen and all of that sort of thing. You know, I can't let this radio go without... I, do you think Ma Perkins might be in this radio? She was America's mother of the air. Ma, I mean, how could I possibly have a show without Ma Perkins? Tune us in. Mom, this is for you. <laughs> Oxidol's own Ma Perkins. And now for Ma Perkins. Well, is Ma going to learn the truth about the cousins at last? Yes. Ma told Shuffle that she would ask some questions about the matter of Sylvester denying that he took Willie's and Evie's money. We know that Sylvester did take that money, and Shuffle is sure of it, but Sylvester lied to Ma about it, and that's what Ma has promised to find out. Within every group of honest professionals, occasionally there's someone who isn't. But how do you find out who they are? A free nationwide information network that lets you check on the background of a profession's members would help. Fortunately, the stock brokerage profession has created just such a network. We can't tell you there haven't been occasional problems in our industry, but we can tell you who they are. The National Association of Securities Dealers. Around here, the ground is hard. Around here, the goal's farther away. The dreams are still dreamed. That's why Special Olympics is here. Helping people with mental retardation become athletes. Helping athletes become respected, accepted. And you can help too. As an athlete, a coach, a volunteer, Special Olympics is training for life. And that means a lot around here. Thank you again. This is Shell Marcus from Dateline Morton Grove with my very special guest, Chuck. Thank you so Shell, much for being a pleasure. on the show. Happy to be here. Uh, we just never have enough time, and, <laughs> and, and I got. I hope you have a state invitation sometime down the road to come back so we can talk a little Always bit more. Always happy to be here with it's you. It's just wonderful to have you, having you here with this, and you got to bring the special radio back. <laughs> okay. This is the super heterodyne. The heterodyne. We'll bring the super heterodyne back <laughs> again, ladies and gentlemen. Shell Marcus, Dateline Morton Grove. I hope you enjoy the show as much as I have. We'll have Chuck Shaden back talking more about old-time radio. Until I see you again, have a good evening. <laughs>